Let me see. Uh, I want to first thank NYU for having me. This is amazing. This venue is beautiful. I might have my wedding here one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, so, um, a lot of people um, who know me, know my case, know that I've been working really hard um, in the past couple of months. Well, the, pretty much since I got out, no, pretty much before I got out of prison on um, the issues around trans awareness, trans violence, um, violence towards women in general, um, police brutality, poverty, classism, sexism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I've never thought that I would come to this point in my life where I would be one of these people who was looked, up, looked at as being a leader because for so long I've been a selfish, jaded bitch. And I just, you know, think about what my life meant to me as far as being a trans woman of color. And I guess that incident that, you know, led, led to my incarceration gave me a different perspective of community, of unity, of being connected with someone outside of uh, sexual escapades and not knowing that I could love or be loved in a way that was sincere and that was authentic and that was um, that I could give back to that person. Um, so it's really amazing to be here and to see so many beautiful people and know that there are so many people in the world that are enthused about being an advocate or an activist and getting involved with their communities, getting involved with um, organizations, getting involved with their school campuses and demanding and in bringing new ways uh, to bring new ways of uh, movement to these uh, play, these institutions that are seemingly oppressive, even college campuses can be extremely oppressive to a lot of people. And knowing that you know, I am helping people have a voice to combat with the ideas of. Uh, binaries, gender binaries, and uh, respectability politics, and how a person should or shouldn't be. So I'm definitely glad that people can live in their ratchetness and uh, <laughs> enjoy that and use that as a fighting force to to find what real liberation looks like outside of the cliche ideas of liberation. Um, because for me, liberation isn't just about, you know, having trans women walk down red carpets. It's about having trans women live their lives on a day-to-day -day basis without having to feel that they're going to be harassed, without having to feel that, you know, they can't live outside of these stereotypes that society has placed upon them. Um, and so I've just been reaching out um, and doing my own education around different cultures, around different activist groups, around different movements to see how I can be a part of that. Um, as you mentioned, the intersections of oppression are deep. And people don't understand that um, because you're fighting for something specific that it, that it wouldn't connect to somebody else's struggle. And, you know, that is definitely being selfish and I had to grow out of that thinking. Because I definitely was all about trans women, trans women. I'm just gonna work in, you know, work for, work with trans women. And I figured that, you know, as time went on and I educated myself and, you know, just reading all of these different books and things and saying like, wow, it's it's amazing in a very bad way how all of these um, institutions of oppression are connected in a way that it 
regardless if it's a war um, in Iraq that it still boils down to my transness and how do I connect with that and why do I connect with that? So I've just been, you know, becoming more self-centered and self-aware um, with myself to be able to identify with the intersections of oppression and know how am I specifically being affected by that? How is my community being affected by that? How are my friends and my family being affected by that? Um, and so, yeah, and that that's what brings me here to speak about these issues around mass incarceration and what allyship means and trans liberation. Um, so, I, I, when we think of mass incarceration, um, we, we see, we have this image of, in our heads of these big buildings with lots of people in them, which is pretty much what it is. But it's deeper than that. It's about capitalism. It's about pro profiting off of black bodies. It's about um, the criminalization and dehumanization and demonizing of black bodies. It's about the biasness that is um, allotted in society and kind of takes away from the potential that so many um, uh, people of color and LGBTQI people have that is being stripped from them because of these um, institutions of oppression, um, like the prison industrial complex. But we can't just see the prison industrial complex as itself when we think of intersections of oppression because there are so many things connected to the prison industrial complex like the entertainment industrial complex, the medical industrial complex, um, so many um, forms of oppression that are connected to that. Um, capitalism, <coughs> uh, sexism, um, racism, the things that keep us thinking that the people who are in prison deserves to be there, that they committed a crime, that you know what happened to them or what they did is why they're in this predicament. But we never think about the, the underlying issues that bring people to those situations. Um, I always talk about uh, mental health when, you know, I'm talking about the prison industrial complex because I feel that a lot of people with mental disabilities and disabilities have been let down terribly um, because instead of using the resources that are invested into prisons, are stripped away from communities, and people with you know mental disabilities don't have the resources uh, to go to these places and get proper medicine or therapy or you know the treatments that they need. And so, if something happens um, outside of that, um, that they're dwelling if they're in you know, the public and something happens and, you know, a, a situation occurs and the police are involved, um, it would have never had to get to that point because instead of, you know, having to do all of this, incarcerate them, put them through this extra turmoil that can further their mental instabilities or disabilities, um, those resources could have been used to build a facilities that people can go to and get the help they needed. Or we think about the schools and prison pipeline. Why are so many prisons being built and schools are being torn down? Why are children um, not feeling safe in their space, in you know, their educational space, when you have cops that are now allowed to carry, you know, grenade launchers and things like this in schools, that is that's unnecessary. Uh, the extra policing uh, that is happening um, as of late is really showing us that um, they're they're afraid of the pushback that they're starting to get from people who are realizing that there is a movement happening, that there is something happening. People are aware of these things now. Uh, they even just passed a law, I forgot which state it is, that says that it is against the law to videotape a cop without their consent. And so people are noticing these things. People, you know, the people who are upholding these positions of oppression are noticing that people are no longer taking any, you know, 
bullshit anymore. Like, we are tired of it, and it's time for us to get involved. It's time for us to push back because uh, we have allowed these things to happen to us for so long, to our loved ones, to, you know, even our enemies, which I would never wish, you know, any of these things. I feel like we probably wouldn't have as many enemies if the world wasn't so fucked up. <laughs> like, we wouldn't have, you know, if people were happy, happier, I should say, um, there wouldn't be any room for depression or anger or hostility or animosity because we would be more in tune with working with each other, with finding solutions for our, you know, our altercations or whatever that don't involve police, that don't involve um, violence, that don't involve, you know, the harming of of our, you know, our bodies in any type of way. So, I, you know, for me, mass incarceration or the prison industrial complex in general is um, just a tiny uh, pea in this bigger pod that is, that is very vast. And, you know, the people who hold powers of oppression are constantly um, you know, pushing us farther away. I've been speaking lately about the marginalization that happens within organizations that claim to be working towards liberation. But how can you be working towards liberation if you're constantly saying, we're only going to work on this issue, we're focused on these things, our organization is for this only, this specifically, this, you know, and it leaves out a whole plethora of issues that are connected to those issues that they're fighting for. But they never, you know, some people don't see these things because a, a person who is fighting for trans liberation would think that, you know, fighting for brutality, police brutality is in the same genre or fighting for immigration is in the same genre or fighting for freedom in Palestine isn't in the same genre but there are definitely connections with all of those things that will come to my transness to your cisness to to all of these different connections and it's our duty to make people see these we can't expect that, you know, people are just going to be aware that people are going to understand that people are going to care um, because we have those feelings for ourselves or for our community or, you know, we share those feelings with other people. Um, it's definitely important that, you know, when we think of the prison industrial complex or prison abolition work, that we think about all the things that are connected to that. Um, and how important it is to um, look at those things outside of just, you know, what it is surfacely and see the real true um, connections uh, with that and other forms of oppression. Um, I, and, you know, with that, you know, allyship um, is a big thing. For me, um, I feel like you know, I, uh, if people know me, I'm I'm very controversial. I'm unfiltered. I have a potty mouth. I I say what I mean and I mean what I say. So you know, it's really important that people do not take this ally weak in vain. That you do not consider yourself an ally because you post pictures on Facebook, <laughs> or on Twitter, or on Instagram. It goes deeper than that. Um, I feel like a lot of people have taken the ideas of allyship and ran with it and co-opted it and kind of left a lot of people out of that or they used it for their own selfish uh, purposes and left a lot of true allies um, with the brew of a person like me who is very open and, you know, as a trans woman of color who already have all of these walls built up from being let down so many times in life, um, 
I, I don't want to work with somebody that is claiming to be an ally, but is only doing it for their own self-gratification. I need somebody that's going to be able to be a risk taker like I am. You know what I'm saying? Especially for a lot of white cis people. Because I tell you, at the end of the day, you still get to leave the environment as a white cis person. I have to leave this environment as a black trans woman. I have a lot of things going against me. And, a lot, and when people don't acknowledge their privileges, it kind of annoys me and it's frustrating because, you know, people will spend more time trying to compare their struggles with mine than trying to figure out solutions for our struggles. And it's not, this is not a tip or tat. I don't care how much more poor you are, <laughs> you're still white and you're still sick. So stop telling me about these things. Let's figure out how to fix them. You know what I'm saying? Being an ally is going to be go matching what somebody is going through at the same level, if not more. You know what I'm saying? Some people, like I said, with show, I, I, see, I know some of these people. I know a lot of these incidents that have happened to me personally where people would come to a march. They're like, oh, CC, take a picture with me. And then like two minutes later, I don't see them because they hopped on the bus and they're like, oh, they got their picture. They, they got what they needed. But you can't c consider yourself an ally if your movement is about social media because social media isn't going to save lives. Social media isn't going to protect you from police brutality. Social media isn't going to protect you from rape. Social media isn't going to protect you from wars and destruction. So we can't think that allyship is a word. And like you were saying, it's, it's, it's no long, it no longer should just be a noun. It should be a verb. Allyship is about the work that you put in. How much, how much of yourself are you connecting with this person? Um, I always say that, you know, love is a radical act that people need to understand that that's, it, that's what allyship is. It's being able to love somebody. And, and I don't want someone to just tolerate me as a trans woman. I want somebody to love me and understand me and care for me and, you know, know what my issues are and not just, you know, sensationalize or fantasize about these issues and, you know, kumbaya over, you know, the bonfire every night and thinking that that's, you know, that that's what, you know, a movement <laughs> is, you know. A lot of hipsters have, you know, come with their green juices and <laughs> the idea is that this, this is what this is what liberation looks like. It's not eating meat and, you know, doing all of this extra stuff and I feel like, you know, fuck your green juice because I still don't have to deal with being a trans woman who is harassed by the police if I'm just standing at the bus stop or if I'm with, you know, one of my white passing friends who don't acknowledge those privileges either for you white passing people who want to take advantage of those privileges when you want to. Um, yeah, honey. Um, and, or if I'm, you know, going, going, if I'm going shopping and being attacked by people outside of a bar because they feel like they have that right for space. Um, and it, it's just annoying to have to deal with those things as a woman, as a trans woman of color who's going to constantly be faced with, you know, situations. Or people who constantly, you know, you know, call themselves allies, but allow bigotry and sexism and racism to be in their space. And your response is, I didn't know how to confront the situation, or I didn't want to confront the situation. What about the people who don't have a choice? What about the people who are constantly being confronted with involuntarily, without any discretion, or you know, people um, who feel that it's their duty to to be assholes? Because it's just some people out there that says, you know what? I, you know, I was having this conversation with a friend earlier. It's like you can't expect that all people are going to be on board with what your, you know, what your movement is. Excuse me, I have a little cold. So if I, if I sound stuffy, I am. Um, so to have this idea that the movement is going to be peachy keen, that, you know, it's going to be all about, you know, 
standing in front of the White House with signs. Like, no, we have to get more in depth and more in tune into what this movement is, what it could be, and what it should be. Um, if we're constantly co-opting allyship, if we're constantly co-opting these movements, if we're constantly co-opting people's struggles, then how are we ever going to actually figure out what the issues are? Because again, it's all about what makes me look good or how, you know, what my friends, how much more cool of what my friends think I am if I did this. And it's not about being cool. It's about liberation. It's about freeing people from these forms of oppression. So if you call yourself an ally, be a true ally. Don't make it a noun, make it a verb. Show people what allyship looks like. If you're a person and, you know, if you're a cis, you know, person and you hear somebody talking about, you know, trans people in a derogatory way, and you walk away from that, you're just as bad as they are. Because, again, for a person like me who is trans, if I, if I walk into a situation like that, I'm not just going to turn around and walk away. I know a lot of trans people do that because out of the fear of not having that support from other people or the fear of the backlash that could come from that. But me, uh, I feel like I can't live in fear. I can't live in the ideas that I'm going to bite my tongue and walk on eggshells because society wants me to. They want, they want me to be as invisible as possible. But that's what we're fighting for, visibility. We're fighting so that people can understand that we're here, that we exist, and that we demand that we have these things. And, but if there are people who are constantly saying, well, I'm an ally, and, you know, you're allowing, you know, these forms of oppression to exist in your space, you know, then that's not allyship, that's just pretending. And it's time that we move out of that, that we think outside of ally or allyship as a noun and think of it as a verb. And I like that y'all said that because um, I think a lot of people use that word in a way that is uh, not a true definition of what ally or allyship is for, you know, me as a trans woman of color, uh, you know, again, like I'm still learning these movements, I'm educating myself on these issues, but I would consider myself to be an ally because you don't hear too many trans women of color talking about freedom in Palestine. You don't hear too many trans women of color talking about police brutality. You don't hear too many trans women of color talking about capitalism. You don't hear too many trans women of color talking about these social injustices that are constantly happening because, you know, we don't have that education or, you know, we don't have the community or those, you know, connections with those people in those movements. And so I'm working hard so that I can be a true ally, so that I'm not just using this word in a way that is, you know, giving me some form of self-gratification and I'm feeling better about myself. Because at the end of the day, no matter how much of an ally I am, there's somebody that's going to be more of an ally, that's going to put in more work, and that's going to do work harder, and I want to be one of those people. But if you're a person that's just using it to make yourself feel better, and that's it, then you should move aside or make space for the people who are true allies that want to be a part of these movements, that want to connect with, you know, these different movements and find these intersections through these movements and educate each other about these forms of oppression and how do we fix those things. Um, trans liberation, you know, uh, Angela that. Uh, <laughs> Angela Davis. <laughs> Angela Davis said that we can't think of any form of liberation if trans liberation isn't a major factor in that. And you know, to hear a legend in the ab oh my gosh, like I'm still like in awe of her saying that, and I have the honor of where we interviewed each other. And when she said that, like, I was lost for words because you don't hear too many people talking about 
trans liberation as being a key part of this movement that's happening. We see um, the co-opting of the Black Lives Matter campaign and so many trans women that have been murdered this year, I believe 15 um, already, that were not a part of the Black Lives Matter campaign. No one marched for them, no one called for justice for them. Um, and again, we're constantly receiving the brute of these movements that claim to be all inclusive, but are constantly being co-opted by people. And the founders of the Black Lives Matter campaign, um, which are queer women of color, right. who actually spoke about the co-opting of this movement and how it's important that when we think of black lives, that we just don't think of black cis lives, that we think of all black lives, and who consists of a black life. I, I'm trans and I'm black, so I should be a part of the Black Lives Matter. Oh, well, not the... Uh, not in that sense, but I'm saying, like, uh, I should not, or any trans woman of color should not be left out of a movement that is that is specific to black lives, when, where we're constantly being left out of these movements because of unawareness or unacceptance or, again, the co-opting of movements by people picking and choosing who they want to be a part of this. Mind you, again, that there have been 15 trans women alone this year that have been murdered. And none of them were a part of the Black Lives Matter campaign. And so they came with the Black Trans Lives Matter. And I feel like um, that's good, but I feel like it, it, it still doesn't alleviate the pain of not being a part of a movement that was supposed to be for all black lives. I shouldn't have to say that I'm trans and I'm black to say that I'm black. You know what I'm saying? Like I should be able to be a part of a, a movement that is for all lives that I consider to be black um, outside of being trans. So to hear Angela, Angela Davis talk about that was empowering because I feel like with a lot of movements that are going on. Um, so many organizations that trans women and trans women of color are running, they are doing um, extreme work around working with different organizations, connecting with different organizations, finding out what the intersections of oppression are. But it, on the other side, we don't get the same type of um, acceptance. Um, and, you know, we're left out of those um, organizations, we're left out of those movements. And so we, you know, we're fighting for the things that everybody else are fighting for, but no one is fighting for trans women in the same light. And we have to think about how we change that. How do we get people to be aware about trans issues? that trans women exist and that regardless of what our occupations are, you know, with the criminalization and dehumanization and demonizing of our bodies, whether you're a sex worker or you're a lawyer, it doesn't matter. We deserve that respect and we deserve for people fighting for us like we're fighting for them. So we have to think about what that looks like, what trans liberation looks like for not just trans people, for, but for all of us who don't identify as trans or who don't identify as LGBTQIA. It's important that we have these connections, that we learn what it is like um, to learn about these intersections of oppression and to collectively come together and figure out how to find, you know, resourceful, intuitive um, means to have a more progressive, liberative movement. Thank you.